Well, good morning. It's good to see you. I got to tell you, this is one of those Sundays where it's kind of like a pinch me moment that I get to be here at this church, that I get to pastor, and that I get to call you family. Uh, seriously, I love it when we start Christmas time together and when we get to recount stories like that and sing the songs like we just did, all the fun that's happening in the lobby today. It's just, it warms my heart, and there's no other place that I'd rather be than to be with the family of God called Grace Chapel. So I love you all, and I'm glad that we're here. I got to tell you, this week we were uh, uh, up in the lobby decorating our staff was. It was kind of a a forced family fun, if you know what I mean. Like we all had to come and be a part of it and we're decorating. And there was a moment where I, I stepped back and I looked at the staff all scurrying around the lobby decorating and I thought, God, you are making this church the church you want it to be. It's not the church that it was four years ago. It's a church that's changed a lot. It's not the church even that I grew up in and I grew up here. It's a church that's continually developing and I think our greatest days are still yet ahead of us. But it is so fun to be a part of this and I couldn't help but get all welled up, you know, with tears as I stood there and I thought, maybe it's just the Christmas decorations and the family thing and all that, but I just thought, this is the church I want to be a part of. I love our church and God's doing a great thing here. He's transforming lives. We see all sorts of things happening through our missions efforts. We see all things happening through our groups and I keep hearing stories. I heard how many, maybe four or five stories just between services today of God's faithfulness. There is so many things God is doing. Aslan is on the move at Grace Chapel and I love that. So I'm, I'm cool with that. So uh, anyway, I'm excited for that and excited to be here. Let's do what we do best here at Grace Chapel. Let's study God's word together. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I truly am grateful for this church. You've heard my thanksgiving already this week to just your faithfulness in this body, the way that you're making this church who you want it to be. God, I thank you that you allowed us to have a renewed story. And even though we've had valleys that we've walked through, we've seen great mountain peaks in the past and we have mountain ranges in front of us. And you are the God who directs us. You are the God who sovereignly provides for us, and you are the very God who is the one worthy of all of our worship. So Lord, as we celebrate the goodness of this church, please, please, I say first and foremost, on behalf of all of us, we're not celebrating our goodness, because I know, Lord, there's nothing good in us. This isn't what we've accomplished. This is what you have com accomplished, and it is marvelous in our eyes. So continue to have your way with us. May we be the bride that you want us to be, May we be washed white with the word and ready to be a light to the world that so desperately needs the hope that you've instilled in our hearts. So we love you and we ask that now you show us your love once again afresh as we look at your word. May your spirit move amongst us. May you use all the preparation and the time I've spent with you in this passage to speak to all of our hearts, mine included, so that we may be transformed. We love you. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, who was the word, I pray. Amen. 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 Well, before Donald Trump became president, before there was the last solar eclipse, before the major shooting in Vegas, before the Me Too movement, before the NFL players contested during the national anthem, before the Winter Olympics in Seoul, Korea, and before Prince Harry married Meghan Mer Markle, we started the Gospel of John. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> All of those things have happened while we've been studying the Gospel of John. Two years we've been studying this Gospel, and it has been an amazing journey. A journey for us as a church to set out to love Jesus Christ more. And the reason that we set out to love Jesus Christ more, the, the, the reason that we set out to study the book of John is because there can never be enough love in our heart for who Christ is, for what he's done, and how he's reconciled us unto the Father. And we've tried really hard to make sure that Jesus is supreme above all things. It's one of our five fingerprints, one of our core values, Christ's supremacy. We want to celebrate it. And I knew as we were rolling out these five fingerprints, it would only be appropriate that we study just how supreme Christ is, that we would fall more in love with him. And I can say for most of us, two years later, we have fallen more in love with Jesus Christ. And this has been an incredible journey. We believe, I believe for sure that Part of a healthy church is to have expository preaching, which means we follow passages verse by verse, line by line. We, we go through a book or a passage and we try to make sure that the point of the passage becomes the point of the sermon. And I've tried really hard as we studied the Gospel of John to make sure that the point of every passage becomes the point of every message. And I hope that's been true and you've seen that to be true. This is the last 
last, last time. Like for me to get my head around the last time in the Gospel of John together, it's just very hard for me. And I, I try, started thinking about um, how should we approach this? I thought maybe if I could invite the Apostle John to preach this last sermon, that would be awesome, but he was quite unavailable. So I, but, but I would say if the Apostle John was here, I do believe he would be able to say that we have truly absorbed the text that he set out to give us all sorts of images of Christ that we could have only known through his record of them. And I think he could say, and I hope the Holy Spirit more importantly can say that we have come to a place of really seeing that Jesus is God and that he has called us to greater faith in himself. We started this series two years ago, this study of John two years ago, but we started a series that I've entitled This Changes Everything just a couple months ago as we started our study in John chapter 20. And we started looking at the post-resurrection Christ, the fact that he rose back from the dead and then he had these encounters with those who were his disciples. And I think what's so profound through these last few chapters and we need to make sure we understand as we leave the Gospel of John is that the very fact that Jesus Christ came back from the dead changes everything for all of us. It changes everything for all of us. Not for some of us, not only for those who believe, but the very fact that Jesus Christ came back from the dead, it demands a decision of belief for everyone. His resurrection changes everything. But I'll be fair to what John wrote in the gospel. I don't think John would say it's just the resurrection that changes everything, but I think he would say that the very fact that Jesus came, that he dwelt with us, that goes all the way back to chapter one, verses one and two, that he came and tabernacled amongst us, that he pitched his tent in our presence. The fact that Jesus became the God man, that he was here on earth, that, that's really what changes everything. The God at the climax of his redemptive story placed his son on earth to live, to die, and then to rise again. And as you will see in our time today, John acknowledges that we really need more pages. We need more paper. We need more books. But even if we had more books to capture all the greatness of Jesus Christ, the world wouldn't be big enough. So we need a bigger globe. I mean, he is so excited about what he has captured for us in a mere 21 chapters. So let's encounter this passage afresh. Let's be excited and, and realize that we've only just begun. In fact, this last week I was sitting in my office frustrated because I couldn't find the title for this sermon. And I pushed back from my desk and I started thinking about all that we'd looked at over the last couple of years. And I welled up with tears and just the greatness of Jesus Christ. And I just uttered out loud, as I often do to myself in my office, we've only just begun. We've only just begun. And then all of a sudden I'm like, that's the title of the sermon. That's it. We've only just begun. We've only just begun to encounter the greatness of Christ. We've only just begun to learn just how wonderful he is. And we have only just begun in this life to get to know him. And we will spend the rest of eternity to get to know him. And I think that's the heart of John in this passage found at the end of his book, John. John chapter 21. Open up your Bibles with me to John 21. We'll look at verses 20 through 25, found on page 907. If you're watching online, I encourage you as well, please click open a, a tab of the Bible or open your Bible. I want you to be looking at this passage with us. I want to make sure that we're studying this together. If you don't have a Bible, feel free to take one of the ones that's in the seat in front of you. I do want to say this. At the end of our time today, I have reserved enough time for me to answer some questions live. So if you have any questions that you would like to ask about John, any of our study in John or something that we look at today, please be ready to ask that question. We're actually going to have roaming mics that'll go through the aisles and gather your questions and I'll interact with you live here. So please think about those questions that you want to ask after we study John 21. If you have your Bibles open and your Bibles on, I want you just to look at those first few verses. Let's look at the first 20. I'll just kind of skim them for you and recount the story for you. What happened was Jesus now post-resurrection is showing up to the disciples who are now out on the Sea of Galilee. Professional fishermen as they were, they went back into the boat, they went back to what they knew, and now they are fishing on the Sea of Galilee. A stranger shows up on the shore, they see him, and he yells out to them, children, have you caught anything? probably somewhat embarrassed, they say no, admitting their own failure there in that moment. And then he says, cast your net on the other side. It had to for some of them, 
bring up memories of what happened early on in their ministry with Jesus Christ. At the very beginning of their call to know Jesus Christ, Jesus had told them to cast their net on another side, Peter specifically, out in a boat where Jesus was doing some teaching. So they cast their net on another, the other side, pull it up. Sure enough, 153 fish are in the net. And John realizes at that moment it's Jesus. So he whispers to Peter, it's Jesus. And Peter puts on his coat and he swims to shore to meet Jesus. At that moment, they have a sweet reunion, a breakfast on the shore. And Jesus allows Peter a chance to overcome his past failure. And I don't just mean failure of not catching fish, though he should have been able to do that because he's a professional fisherman, but his failure of denying Christ three times. Christ asks him three questions. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Peter replies, yes, I love you. Yes, I love you. Of course, you know everything. Yes, I love you. Seemingly somewhat offended by the questions. But these questions allowed Peter to confess his love for Christ, which in some ways seemed to replace his three previous denials that happened around the crucifixion. They're having this sweet breakfast. And at the end of this exchange with Peter, Jesus says to him, follow me, follow me. The same words that he said to him at the very beginning of his call, follow me. And we're picking up right after he has just said that to Peter. Now understand, Peter was a confident man. He was competent, but he was also competitive. You're going to see a bit of his competitive nature come out now in the next few verses. And yet Jesus is so gentle to focus him back on the awe and wonder that is found only in him. Look at verses 20 through 23. Let's just do those three to start. It says, Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. The one who, is, who also had leaned back against him during the supper and had said, Lord, who is it that's going to betray you? Just, let's read that slowly, understand Peter is being followed by the disciple who Jesus loved. Who is that? John. John refers to himself as the disciple who Jesus loved. But just so that we're clear, he makes it very apparent that this is the exact disciple who was leaning against Jesus. So he's talking about his proximity to Jesus. It's the very one who asked the question, who is it that's going to betray you? Just so we have no question of who this was, he's making it very clear this was John who was following them. I love that. John's authoring his own gospel. So he wants to make sure you understand all the characters without using his own name, right? So he makes that clear. Then it says in verse 21, when Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? And Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. So the saying spread abroad among the brothers that the disciple was not to die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die. But if this is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? I'm not going to spend a whole bunch of time unpacking verse 23, but let me just give you a, a snippet of what it's about. Basically, Peter re is rebuked by Jesus. Jesus says, stop comparing yourself to John. What is it to you that he lives and does not die until I return? And then John's saying, so then everybody started talking about how I wasn't going to die, right? How I'm going to be around forever. But then John clarifies and says, but just so you know, he didn't actually say it to me. He just said, maybe I wouldn't die. He didn't actually tell me I wasn't going to die. So he's like giving all these clarifying statements. We do know that John lived longer than any of the other apostles. That John had the longest life and was able to do some further writing, including the book of Revelation, which is important to us. But the, the point there was more for Peter to not compare himself to John. I mean, understand what's happening here in the text. They're having this exchange, Jesus and Peter. Peter should have humbled himself to realize how sweet it is to be reconciled with the Savior. He's just told, follow me. And then here in this passage, Peter is asking Jesus about the disciple who Jesus loved. Now, it's difficult to interpret the tone of his question, but he basically is saying, what, a, what about this man? Maybe it was a very loving tone. Maybe he really, really cared what was going to happen to John. But I think that it's reasonable to assume that Peter may be measuring himself up to John just a little bit. Peter was just given a glimpse that he would die by persecution. And so now he's asking this question. He's comparing himself seemingly to John. Now, while Peter may have had a competitive tone, and we've seen this other places in the gospel, I can't help but notice that I think John has a bit of a competitive tone as well. John, throughout his entire gospel, has been clear to tell us that he's the disciple whom Jesus loved. 
We also know that John will give us other things, including in this passage, to point out some kind of superiority to the other disciples. He was the closest to Jesus at the supper, pointed out to us here in John chapter 21, but also pointed out to us in John chapter 13 at the supper. John was also quick to say he had privileged access to hear the trial of Christ that none of the other disciples had. Or, or how about the time that he made it very clear just a chapter ago that he beat Peter when they ran to the tomb, right? I mean, he, he specifically says, I outran Peter. And not only that, but I believed before Peter did. And then in this same chapter, it's as if he points out, I had to help Peter realize it was Jesus on the shore, right? Because he captures in his own gospel that he says to Peter, it's Jesus on the shore. I think there's some competitiveness in both of these disciples. I think these are rough and tough gentlemen, confident. They, they loved Christ. They wanted to do great things for Christ. But they started getting a little bit competitive even amongst themselves. And this is post-resurrection post-resurrection, right? I mean, of course it kind of makes sense before the cross, but then even after the cross, they're still, well, like, who's the greatest, right? Now, 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 now I, I will be kind to John and say it could be, it could be that he simply realized he was deeply loved by Christ and all of the statements he said were just to show us that he was deeply loved by Christ. It, it could be. I don't know exactly John's motive, but the scripture does seem to be clear that Peter is comparing himself to John. He's questioning Jesus in some kind of way, comparing himself to the other disciple in order to somehow reaffirm himself and his calling or his reconciliation to Christ. Jesus, in essence, says back, mind your own business. Jesus clearly and strongly redirects Peter away from using the calling of John as some other way to measure his own calling. He redirects his eyes. And I can say to every single one of us as followers of Christ, we must respond to Jesus Christ based on our own individual calling, never, never comparing ourselves to the calling or the gifting or the provision of other Christians in the church of Christ. We trust God and his authority in our life individually. Yes, he is over all of us. We're all members of one body. He provides for the whole body, but we are all still members. We're all different. And we trust him for the way that he provides for us. And we live our life without comparing ourselves to other people. Now, when Jesus says to him, you follow me, he's saying to Peter, you look at me and no one else. This brings up the idea of Hebrews chapter 12. You're running the race marked out for you. Keep your eyes fixed on me, author and perfecter of your faith. Don't look side to side. Don't look about around who's running next to you, who can study the Bible more efficiently than you, who's smarter than you, who serves harder than you. You keep your eyes fixed on me. The sole focus of the disciples and also for us is Jesus Christ. We focus on him and we do not compare ourselves to other people. Here's an application point for you today. Following Christ is not a competition. Following Christ is not a competition. Our walk with Jesus Christ is an individual walk. Yes, we walk together as a body. I never want to go on record as discounting the power of the church and us working together. We all work together. But there is an individual call on each and every one of our lives to run the race marked out for us. And when we compare ourselves to other Christians, it is detrimental to our faith. When we compare ourselves to other people, instead of keeping our eyes focused on the prize of Jesus Christ, it will stumble up your faith. And maybe not just your faith, but those you compare yourself with or those who hear you are comparing yourself with someone else. I wrote this down in the margin of my Bible. In our Christianity, we are to foster trust, not comparison. When it comes to following Jesus Christ, we foster trust, not comparison. My friends, Jesus is so gracious to have an individual relationship with each and every one of us, isn't he? He has an individual relationship with all of us. He doesn't just see us as a bunch of cookie cutters that follow him, but rather we are all his individual children. 
I think about parenting my two kids, of which they're right over here, Chandler and Grace, two very different kids. I got an eight-year-old and a six-year-old. And these two kids, among my others, these two kids are very different, right? You're different, right? I mean, when I have to say something to Gracie, I can just give you a little look and you, you know, right? You just are like, yeah, I know. Whereas Chandler, like you and I, we got to like arm wrestle it out. You have a, f- a few thousand questions about why dad said something, right? And finally it ends in some other kind of conversation, right? Yeah, I owe you ice cream for this illustration, okay? <laughs> but you're two they're very different kids, very different kids. And I parent them different. They're different in how they receive discipline, how they receive discipleship. They have different personalities. They have different gift sets. They have different struggles. So our heavenly father, who is the greatest father, realizes that each and every one of us is different. And he reserves his own right as our father to shape us, to give us different callings, to correct us differently, to give us different suffering and to give us different joys. He's our father and he knows everything about us and it is a supreme sign of his love that he meets us in such individual ways and gives us such individual portions to our own individual context, portions of his glory, portions of himself that make sense or are right for us. Far from requiring children to abandon their identity in Christ, when they come to Christ, far is the gospel from some kind of flat, put on this uniform, look like everybody else kind of belief system. Following Jesus Christ means that your own unique gifts, your own unique skills, your own unique calling is how God will place himself within your story to glorify himself. He is glorified and delights in the fact that in your individual life, He can display his supremacy. He can display his creativity. He can display his love. He can display his glory all through diverse beauty, diverse beauty. And collectively then, that diverse beauty makes this whole beauty of the church. We're all different, all different, but yet we submit to Christ as our head. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, great passage controversial in some circles, but a great passage that talks about the the diversity of the body, how the body of Jesus Christ is uh, all different parts, but there's unity. It's all different parts, but there's harmony. It's all different parts, but there's interconnectedness. There's different callings. And in all of this, in 1 Corinthians 12, we realize that Christ fulfills the fullest picture of his beauty and his love to the world by allowing us as Christians to all be different. Most of you know that well-worn truism of comparing apples to oranges. If you think about Christianity and a bunch of Christians, we're not to be compared just because we're part of the same classification. I can't take an apple and an orange just because they're both fruit and compare them to one another. They are different. How I eat an orange is different than how I eat an apple. When an orange is ready to eat is different than when an apple is ready to eat. They are different. They're both fruit, but they're different. I use different sets of standards for measuring them. They are individual types of fruits. And so also in the body of Christ, we all have Christ as our head. He is supreme, but he gives each and every one of us distinct gifts to use for blessing the body. Let me zoom in, verse 11 of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It says, all of these are empowered by one in the same spirit. He's talking about those who believe in Christ, who apportion to each one individually as he wills. So we're all given different gifts. This chapter is about gifts. We're given different gifts, but we're given them based on how God individually wills them to be how he gives them to each and every one of us. Verse 18 gets to the same thing. It says, but as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chooses. We are all different and we are different by God's design. He's the one that made it this way. So if you use Paul's illustration of all being members, it's like all being parts of a body. Think of a physical body. We can't complain when all of a sudden we, the knee, are not able to smell as good as the nose right? We are different. Comparison within the body of Christ is not only a waste of energy, but it's dishonoring to the 
powerful design that God has built in to his church. We as believers in Jesus Christ are to trust Jesus in his calling on our life. Trust the portion that he gives us, the success that he gives us, the blessings that he gives us. All of these are what he wants for us to have so that we may be useful in bringing him glory. It's not a comparison thing. Christianity is not about you comparing yourself to other people. Rather, it's about relying on Christ and then serving one another. Think about the greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength. That's my first calling, my main calling. And the next is like it, to love others as myself. It is a love for God and a love for others, not a love for God in a comparison to others. The best illustration I can think of this is uh, when I lived in Chicago, I had two roommates, Tim and John. And Tim and John were super excited about running the Chicago Marathon. They'd actually, John had done it a few times and, and they were really excited. Notice that I said they were excited to run the marathon. Okay, it was two of the three of us that were excited. I didn't run the marathon. I watched the marathon. I held water at the marathon, but I did not run the marathon. And they were super excited and they started training and training and John was really training. He wanted to qualify for the Boston. And so he was excited about this and they had these long runs during the week and really, really long runs on Saturday. And finally the marathon comes and it was perfect because our apartment was right on the marathon route in downtown Chicago. So all I had to do was wake up, get my coffee and walk outside to watch the marathon. But they got up early that morning and they go to run the marathon. And I knew what John's time was and I knew what Tim's time was. And it was different because John was eventually gonna run faster than Tim and, and hopefully qualify. So I'm watching the time and I'm realizing John should be passing now and he wasn't passing. He wasn't passing. I waited for him, he wasn't passing. I thought maybe I missed him. Maybe he just ran so fast I couldn't see him, right? And then uh, Tim's time came and Tim wasn't passing. He wasn't passing. I thought, this is so odd. And I was really confused and finally... I mean, we're talking like tail end of the marathon. All of a sudden, John and Tim come walking down the street and Tim has his arm hung over John's shoulder and they're walking the marathon. And so I jumped in and walked the marathon with him because I can do that. I can walk the marathon. <laughs> so I'm, I'm walking with them. I say, guys, what happened? Well, as the story goes, they were running together early on in the marathon and Tim hurt his knee. And Tim said to John, John, go, you want to qualify for Boston? You go, you run, just go, I'll be okay. I'll figure it out. And John said, are you sure? And he said, yeah, I'm, I'm sure. And so John ran and he ran and ran. And finally, at some point he realized, wait a second, finishing this marathon without Tim is not as meaningful to me. I need to go back and be a true brother to Tim. So he went back, he ran backwards in the marathon and he ran back to Tim and he carried Tim and they walked all the way to the end of the marathon. And I thought, man, what a picture of brotherhood, of not competing, but of being faithful to the one that he loved and called brother. See, the faithfulness of God is often seen through the faithfulness of God's people. You have to understand this. We love one another, not comparing ourselves to one another because it's a part of how we portray the faithfulness of God. When we experience God's goodness firsthand in our life, then we can't help but show love to other people. We love to live out the love one another's because we have been so loved. And John realized how loved he had been. And yes, they might've had some comparison between at least these two disciples, but he finally comes around in verse 24 and says, my whole reason for doing what I do is to proclaim Christ, to make sure Christ is known and that the testimony that I've given is true. Look at verse 24, he says, this is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things. And we know that his testimony is true. One commentator suggested that John, prior to this passage, had called himself the disciple whom Jesus loved so many times because he was trying to say, I am loved by Christ. I have experienced his love. And because I have been loved by him, I then am authorized to tell you about Jesus Christ, God incarnate. I have been loved. I experienced it firsthand. If you think about it, Jesus came loved by the Father to proclaim to us the Father. And so those of us who are loved by Christ then go on as beloved disciples authorized to proclaim the historical Jesus as true. That he did come, that he did die, and that he did rise again. 
John had been so loved and experienced Christ that he said, my life bears witness to Christ. It's all true. Everything I've said to you is true. Here's an application that I think we could learn from his example, and that is this. Following Christ demands that we bear witness to his work. If we have experienced Christ and the transforming power of forgiveness, of mercy, of grace in our life, then we must be witnesses to his work. I don't want you to hear this as being a witness is just for those who are given the gift of evangelism. That passage is taken so out of context where it says some are gifted to be pastors, teachers, evangelists. Yes, there are evangelists given as gifts to the body of Christ. But all of us are called to bear witness if we believe in Jesus Christ. Some of us with the gift of evangelism may be better than others at sharing Christ, but that doesn't mean that you are exempt from sharing Christ. If you have personally experienced his power in your life, then you use it to portray his faithfulness. You're constantly telling people how God is faithful in your life. One of my favorite things uh, that's happened in this last few months at our church is what happened last week when we put these microphones at the end of the aisle and to have people come forward. And I know some of their backstories and I know things they've been facing. And I saw them stand here and say, God is so faithful or I thank God because, and they gave witness to what God's doing in their life. That's what he asks of us. Following Christ is just to say, he's been faithful to me. You don't have to be versed in apologetics. You don't have to be the greatest evangelist that ever lived the planet. There's no need to have to mimic Billy Graham and do stand-up crusades. You just got to be faithful in your life to tell people about how God has been faithful to you. If you think about your journey with Christ, it's probably somewhat like mine. All of ours are. We walk through this forest of faith, as I call it. And Christ goes before us and he's paving a path for us. Just like there's a path where people walk and finally the grass gets matted down and it's clear where to walk. So Christ has called you to discipleship and it is a costly call, but he goes before you. He paves the path for you. He makes it clear for you. Through his sacrifice, we know from John chapter one, verse 29, he's the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He's made a path for you to the throne room of God. And so also he prepares a way for you to follow him through the valleys of shadow and death, through the hard times, through the suffering, through even the good times. He goes before you, he prepares a path for you and he's asking, please just bear witness to what I've done in your life. There are a few ways I think you could be better prepared to bear witness. Here, I wanna tell you a couple of things that I do. And notice I said, better prepared to bear witness. How do I get my heart ready to speak of the faithfulness of God? Here's a couple of things I do. I have a journal that I will write little bullet points in. Maybe sometimes it's one bullet point, sometimes it's 15 bullet points, but I have this journal that I keep in my little quiet time box, or sometimes it's hanging out in my laptop bag, but I will write down some specific things that God is doing in my life and just keeping track of how he's faithful. I also have an app on my phone called Day One, where I just put down bullet points of God's faithfulness in my life. And I look back at that, And I go, wow, he's so faithful. And as I keep track of how he's been faithful, I'm more ready to tell someone else when they ask me at a party, Christmas party, whatever kind of party, they say, how have you been? I gotta tell you something. God has been so good. And all of a sudden, one, two, three of those bullet points fall right off my tongue. I'm cultivating a heart of gratefulness by remembering the faithfulness of God and preparing myself to bear witness. Another thing that I do is I love to listen to the testimonies of other people where God has been faithful. Today in our service, you heard the story of Justin, how God has been faithful to Justin, how God has moved him along. I love listening to other people's stories. This week, I sat with our counseling team on Wednesday and we listened to a woman's story who was molested at a very young age who had terrible things that happened in her life, but she talked about the faithfulness of God in even the hardest days of her life. I've shared that link with several people this week. Why? Because when we listen to the testimonies of God's faithfulness towards his children, it cultivates in our heart, not only just encouragement, but a readiness to talk about the great and mighty works of God. It's easy to get down about what happens in this life, isn't it? It's easy to get down when we see the suffering and the pain around us. It's easy to get down. But when I'm recounting the faithfulness of God, I'm gonna be more quick to give witness and say, listen, I'm not home yet. I'm not home yet. 
Of course I'm going to suffer here. And then of course there's going to be hard things because I'm not home yet. C.S. Lewis said it well. He said, if I go through this life and I try to find, uh, I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, I try to find something to satisfy my desire, then the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. And I think about that in relation to God's faithfulness and recounting it is when we realize that there's nothing truly that satisfies us, then we must come back to this place of finding all of our hope in the awesomeness of Christ, the greatness of his reign and the mighty works that he does in the past, in the present and what he will do in the future. Here's a final point of application for you. Following Christ should cultivate unending awe for God in your life. Following Christ should cultivate unending awe for God in your life. Look at verse 25, the very last verse in the Gospel of John. You ready for this? This is what he says, verse 25. Now there are also many other things that Jesus did where every one of them, excuse me, were every one of them to be written. I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. I love that. Do you hear the awe that he has? If I kept writing, I would run out of paper. And even if I had enough paper, I'd run out of room. And we've for sure run out of time. There are so many things Christ has done. That's what John's saying. He has such awe in his life for what Jesus Christ has done. Now, I've talked to you about awe before. I think awe is something that all of us should have in our Christian life. And if we have lost it, or if we have what one author calls awe amnesia, we stop seeing the beauty of Christ and we have to do whatever we can to get back to it. What does it mean to have awe in our life? It means that we see the gospel as the very thing that sustains us. It means that we see the greatness of God as fundamental to our living, that all of our relationships and even the most mundane things in this life come back to my relationship with Christ. If it wasn't for him, in the greatest things and the mundane things, I would have no hope. If you need help cultivating this sense of awe in your life, I want to point you to a book called Awe, written by Paul David Tripp. The subtitle is Why It Matters for Everything We Think, Say, and Do. It's an amazing book, a great book. I've read it. Steve's read it. Uh, Lowell's read it. Some people on our staff here have read it. It's a very, very powerful book, but I, I recommend this book to you. And maybe you need to go read this over this next month. But listen to what Paul David Tripp says in, in one of these pages that I love. He says, I, I came to see that I was wired for awe that awe of something sits at the bottom of everything I say and do. But I wasn't just wired for awe. I was wired for awe of God. No other awe satisfies the soul. No other awe can give my heart the peace, rest, and security that it seeks. I came to see that I needed to trace the awe of God down to the most mundane of human decisions and activities. Friend, maybe in your life you've lost some awe for God because you're moving too fast. Maybe you need to slow down and maybe you just need to absorb the greatness of God and spend more time in the word and spend more time praying. I truly believe that our hurried pace in life is the mother of causing us to have awe amnesia. It is the very thing that gives birth to us feeling like we have grown too familiar with the gospel because we're moving too fast or we're on to the next thing. But maybe, my friends, it's time for you to slow down and to simply meditate on God's goodness. Psalm 145, it says, On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works I will meditate. John, I think here at the end of his gospel, says, Listen, there are so many great things Jesus has done, more than any pages could ever withhold. But you and I and all of us, we must continue to meditate on the greatness of Christ, the goodness of God shown to us through Jesus Christ. So my friends, remember, following Christ isn't a competition. Following Christ demands that you bear witness to his work. And following Christ means that you're constantly working to develop a sense of awe in your life for just how good and gracious our King and Savior is. Amen? Amen.